Welcome to A Thrivable Life, a podcast that shows how ordinary people can take everyday actions towards a thrivable future where everyone lives in harmony with nature. Hi, I'm Kavya, a project manager by profession, and I'm interested in learning about the impact we have on the environment and society and in turn how we are shaped by it. And I'm Mike. I'm a research assistant at Thrive with a background in political science and social policy. I also have a passion for social and environmental sustainability, as well as biodiversity. And we are from the Thrive Project, the not-for-profit research institute, think tank and advocacy group. Kavya and I will be your co-hosts as we talk with our special guests about how we can create a world that is not just sustainable, but one that thrives. Before we introduce this week's guest, we would like to recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first peoples of this place now known as Australia, as well as First Nations people across the globe. And today we talk about an aspect of sustainability, specifically on fast fashion. We would like to introduce today's guest, Noelia Castro from Argentina. She has completed her bachelor's in public relations and master's in public administration. She has a deep interest in sustainability and sustainability practices and works as a trainer and team assistant at Thrive. Hi, Noelia. Thanks for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. Let's maybe begin with talking about fast fashion, which is the topic for today. Um, could we start by defining what fast fashion is? Yeah, so basically when we talk about fast fashion, we are talking about the rapid production of inexpensive, trendy clothing that is quickly produced to respond to the latest fashion trends. So these uh, clothes are usually created by using cheap materials and labor, allowing for a swift turnover in styles and very affordable prices. And why is it a problem? You know, we do talk about fast fashion being bad for the environment, bad for just in general, you know, people. But, but could we probably get into why that's the issue and like what's the impact of fast fashion? On the one hand, it's that it contributes like significantly to the environmental degradation. So this is because the production uh, process of, fa of fast fashion involves like a high water usage, pollution from chemicals, uh, excessive waste. So all of this contributes on the one hand to climate change. We also have, uh, for example, ethical concerns because many fast fashion brands are um, associated with unethical labor practices, which includes maybe low wages, poor working condition, exploitation of workers, mainly and usually in developing countries. It promotes also um, disposable culture. And this is because uh, the clothes are worn a few times and then thrown away. So this contributes a lot to the global issue of textile waste. And I think that we can also mention lack of transparency. Usually fast fashion brands lack transparency in their supply chains. So it's difficult for us as consumers to know the true cost of the clothing in terms of both environmental and social impacts. The impacts are pretty uh, are significant as, as Noelia was mentioning. I was just looking up, uh, I noticed a Greenpeace mentioned that um, even when it comes to climate change, that um, our fast, fast fashion itself uh, accounts for about 8 to 10% of the um, of climate change and the carbon footprint. Um, and obviously, a lot of that is connected to the disposable nature of, of it. But there's obviously a lot of uh, impacts at the production and, and manufacturing stage uh, of fast fashion throughout the supply chains. And there's also uh, significant impacts on, on biodiversity, and I think it was something like 20% uh, of the uh, uh, global industrial uh, water water waste uh, that fast fashion accounted for. So from the manufacturing stage onwards, it's uh, quite uh, devastating to the environment. And obviously, yeah, as uh, mentioned, the sweatshops and working conditions from, uh, in many developing countries uh, where there is, um, yeah, the cheap labour which are uh, in sort of very substandard conditions for people who are in a way which uh, produces very cheap yet easily disposable, um, a high turnover of, of products. And yeah, so it's pretty obviously bad, um, both socially and environmentally across the board. Yeah. And one of the other things that I've uh, recently seen, and they're able to do 
these really trendy clothing also because a lot of times there's no clear i think indication of whose designs these are i think recently there were there were some brands that sued another uh, uh, company for copying their designs and just use them off and were, could really have get a great market share in, in the process um and i think that's maybe some of the how or how how they're able to do these as fast as they can um are there any other uh, you know ways that actually makes it easier for companies to be able to you know promote fast fashion so fast fashion usually what it does uh it's replicate runway and designer trends quickly so that's one of the ways that yeah they are able to do it this fast because they basically they don't have to think about the design it's already there they just copy it but also a few ways to recognize uh fast fashion it will be like mainly low prices so the price is remarkably low compared to maybe traditional retail market so i don't know if you see clothes that it's the price is too good to be true then yeah probably you're uh, looking at fast fashion brand another way is the high turnover so fast fashion brands frequently they release new collections even weekly so the emphasis is on speed and constant change this way they encourage consumer to buy more and more and more and another uh, maybe way to recognize it is the the quality so they focus in quantity over quality so initially the items might look good but they are often made with super materials so the lifespan of the item is very short i think that's one of the biggest concerns people do you know gravitate towards them because they have these very appealing designs and it, i guess in the world of like social media where you do want to kind of keep up with the trends it does turn out to be a very lucrative uh, you know way of buying clothes on one hand it is affordable so we do need to i think give it credit to an extent that is affordable clothing especially if you cannot afford um some of the higher quality ones um but from a long term perspective if you just look at the life of a product and how well you're able to kind of keep keep your clothing on for a long time then you would have to weigh the costs of how often you replace your winter clothing or sweatshirts or your shirts or hat or whatever uh, maybe that's one way that people could think about um how different it is um uh, compared to what they would go and just just buy or pick up a new one um and and thinking of that uh, how do they manage to do it i think it's still something that i kind of pondered over how are businesses able to do we did speak about i think their production lines uh, the fact that they are able to get cheaper material and designs um it's is it also the reach of these companies because most of these are big brands and kind of worldwide brands and it could even be the case of some level of i guess dumping uh, you know accepting materials in some countries which might not be acceptable broadly some of the others is that something that we have seen i think yeah across you know when we look at um large companies across the board yeah there are loopholes in different regards where um production is done within different countries which don't have the same laws that uh, regulate conditions and obviously this can be exploited so that's probably uh one aspect of it that cheaper wages can be paid where there aren't conditions protecting uh workers uh within laws within specific countries so that's obviously a way in which uh international you know uh you know companies are able to to utilize that to their advantage and um yeah that's probably one of the biggest things i'm not sure i'm not sure beyond that um other than yeah like you mentioned their reach and and other factors yeah to do with some of the bigger brands addressing some aspects of of their environmental or social impact and and seeing seemingly uh trying to promote the idea that they are doing the right thing by addressing certain aspects of it whether it's the carbon footprint or or um labor practices or whatever but then other aspects of environmental or social uh exploitation do continue to go on and so that's probably a, another aspect of it too yeah and i think the reason they do it because being sustainable is fashionable as well i mean at least today and in, in the past few years it has turned out to be something that's trendy to be sustainable use sustainable materials 
but I guess the broad definition of not knowing what it means to be sustainable is what maybe is a loophole that they they are able to really exploit well and market saying okay we have this new as made of sustainable practices or uh, made with a sustainable material maybe it has like you know two percent cotton and they'll be like this is organic cotton and it's now a sustainable material um, those are also I think some ways that they're able to get into the trend faster than most other I guess brands are able to um, yeah that could be some of the ways that they've done yeah and I, I actually think connected to that I think it's important that uh, I suppose the public is made more aware of our sustainability and and the ways in which things can be presented which perhaps aren't as sustainable as they are um and uh that yeah the public needs to be more aware and there perhaps needs to be better labeling associated with that or monitoring or third party monitoring of what what is, the level of sustainability of particular products and uh, what companies are are doing in this regard um yeah so they can't say one thing and actually be doing another yeah, so actually the best way for us to avoid fast fashion is that, educate ourselves about the fashion industry, learn um, the practices of different brands, uh, and maybe choose those ones that align ethical and sustainable values. Because yes, as you mentioned before, lots of brands, what they do, they go to maybe developing countries with maybe the laws are not uh protecting the workers so it's cheaper to uh, produce over there and yeah sometimes we don't know about this we just look mm, the outside of the brand and that's it you know and are there any regulatory frameworks in maybe some countries that that look into it because i think the multiple aspects of it we spoke about the ethical aspect the focus rights and just uh that's one. Then we have the sustainable practices in terms of production, how much wastage they generate and how you know it affects the environment they go in. And lastly, we have a wastage aspect as well, I think we spoke about. So are there any regulatory favorites that help us, you know, could could be guidance? When it comes to working conditions, many Western countries do, do have that. Obviously, that can be an issue across the board anyway, like say a country like Australia. There can, to some extent, be you know workplace exploitation within specific industries. Not in all, some are some are more uh, prominent than others. I know in hospitality, construction, the seafood industry, for example, there's been a lot of uh, workplace abuse, for example. But generally speaking, like in a country like Australia, there is a lot of workplace protections, and I think you know many parts of say Southeast Asia, there there isn't that uh, those human rights protections uh, to anywhere near the same extent. And obviously, when it comes to environmental, um, you know, regulations and that, it's a little bit trickier and a little bit more murky. Um, there are obviously regulations, but there's probably uh, in terms because we're not talking about, let's say, human rights and, and social issues, it, a lot more say uh, or lack of regulation seems to exist in a lot of a lot more loopholes within specific industries. And, and I think that's something I will personally have noticed is the the extent to which uh, certain industries and lobby groups will enable sort of economic uh, profitability to outweigh environmental regulations but i think in some countries I, I probably can't speak off the top of my head i think some countries in within northern europe for example have had employed uh, and, and uh, to north america to an extent have employed um, some uh, heavier environmental regulations and standards but i think a lot more needs to be done in that regard and i think perhaps a lot more has already been done in regard to the the social um, regulations regarding say work, worker protection uh, compared to the environmental uh, regulations overall. I mean, you just have to look at the dominant industries <laughs> globally to, to see uh, how, how much environmental regulation is really going on. The fashion industry obviously has has a big impact, but, um, you know, you look at certain aspects of sustain, you know, not sustainable agriculture and the oil and gas industry, it gives you a very clear perspective on, on the, the level to which... Um, uh, profitability uh, sort of outweighs regulation in many, regard, many regards. Yeah, and some of the solutions that, that go in, I think what you mentioned, just looking even for organizations that need to define their objectives on multiple fronts. I think we talked about it from, I guess, a multi-capital perspective at Thrive. Uh, maybe you could speak a little bit on how that's one of the solutions for companies that might actually want to change. I think, you know, yeah, you look at the multi-capital approach or entity model approach, uh, and, and you see, you know, by incorporating the social and environmental uh, impacts of a particular company into the running and operations of that company, that's where 
yeah, it's going to deliver on on sort of better outcomes overall. Where obviously that, that's a major sort of impact within the, the the sort of business world now, where profitability has been put ahead of of the other other factors. Where but where we employ that, recognizing the environmental and social impacts as much in that um, in that area as well as things like values based innovation, which take in into consideration the different environmental and social shared value bases that we have as uh, aspects of, say, shareholder interest, but also, you know, public interest and investment within a, um, or, you know, reputation for a, for a company. Um, you know, these are sort of aspects of the, uh, a few aspects of the Thrive Framework, which looks to promote uh, sustainability in this regard, looking at both the, the social and environmental uh, influences. But, um, yeah, I think, as you, as you mentioned, yeah, multi-capital, among others, uh, are ways to address this maybe move on to like solutions of what day-to-day people could do do you have any recommendations yes so there's a few ways to identify them as i mentioned before um the low prices the rapid uh, changing of uh, the collections the quality and the the copying of the designs right but there's also a few ways that we can uh, practice to avoid fast fashion. And one of them, I believe it's um, basically secondhand shopping. So we can explore thrift stores or um, online secondhand platforms, you know? So this way we can give uh, items that were uh, loved by somebody else before a new uh, use. And this way we can reduce the demand for new clothing. We can actually support sustainable brands which uh, sometimes this might be a little bit more expensive, but we can prioritize sustainability, ethical production, transparency in their supply chains, educate ourselves about it. And even though it's a little bit more pricey, we can invest in quality pieces and buy just a few of them and not buy uh, numerous cheap, cheap items, you know? So we invest in high quality, timeless pieces, right, that are durable and maybe they have a longer lifespan and we don't have to buy so many. When you go on the website, the level of transparency uh, from the company kind of gives you an idea of whether they might still be actually sustainable or they might just be putting it out there as a name. Uh, Also, I think their take back practices, any wastage, I mean, I think some of the European regulations require folks to now manufacturing companies to actually trace their waste all the way and be responsible for how their items get wasted. So there are some mechanisms by which if brands have started to look into those and know, have an idea of how to either take back items or recycle them, that gives you a good idea that they probably are um, more conscious. Do you have any closing uh, remarks or Mike, any other ideas that you have uh, that you wanted to talk about? I just uh, think, yeah, as Noelia mentioned, yeah, I think as it, as the public becomes more educated and aware of these things and, and takes uh, approaches into their own hands to buy it more sustainably, buy brands that they know are more sustainable and buy, yeah, also, as, as Noelia mentioned, you know, uh, looking at uh, secondhand shops and, and so forth for, for clothing um, and, and, yeah, just being more educated and more aware of it what fast fashion is and and how to avoid it, I think that's probably one really good step at least of, of trying to address address it and, um, yeah, address the issue. Um, but, yeah, I think that's probably a very good way to start. And maybe uh, I could just mention lastly, if you're buying local, there's a high probability that your footprint is already less and you might be less inclined to finding. And by local, I don't mean just brands that are registered in your local area, but actually manufacture and make things. Uh, around you but thank you so much Noelia and Michael for joining us and having this discussion uh, we'll try and put some links out in the notes which probably help us provide more sources for folks who want to have a look at that but thank you so much Noelia for sitting down with us thank you guys for having me thanks Noelia thanks Gavia and keep on trying.